Can you see that? Oh yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Oh, Good. hallelujah. So anyway, I thought you, you, if you don't know each other, I thought we'd just go around um, and start. Let's see, how does my, uh, there we go. Um, start with a quick introduction uh, about who you are, maybe a, a thing or two about your life here. And then, and then what attracted you to this course and what do you hope to get out of it? Maybe you don't know, but those are the two sort of introductory questions we're tossing out there tonight. So whoever wants to go, go ahead. Can you see that? Okay. Can you read that? Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Good. Good. Okay. We'll go. Okay. So, thanks. I'm Nancy Morrow. This is Warren. We've been at Epiphany for two and a half years or so. Um, and what attracted me to this course was I, I've been, I think I've practiced most of the spiritual practices most of my life, um, but never looked at them holistically or thought of them as a, 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 t a one unit of a thing <laughs> or a, a path. It was, it was just um, always part of my life. I mean, not all of them, I, you know, most of them, many of them. And I'm really looking forward to exploring them more deeply mm -hmm. and how I can walk that path towards a, a deeper, deeper spiritual, um, spiritual life. Thanks, Nancy. Yeah. yeah. More? I, uh, just a right herd on that. Um, uh, less of my life uh, than hers in terms of practicing in these, but our married life together, we've dabbled in and ex expanded our involvement with most of these uh, together. Um, the uh, you've described it, Doy, uh, I, it, as sort of uh, you know the spiritual gym aspect, uh, and uh, I, you know one of the things you can do is check how many times you've actually registered at the dem, gym and been there. And uh, for me, it's not enough as it ought to be, or as much as I want it to be. So this is a good opportunity to give it a go again. Excellent. Thanks, Warren. I'm glad you're here. Uh, I'm, Al, I'm Al Einstein, and huh? uh, I'm here because my wife said I had to be. <laughs> now, here she is. <laughs> Good. Now we're here. Now we're here. We'll see. <laughs> no, it, that, I, was, I was probably exaggerating, but it was my wife's idea that maybe this would be a good thing for us to do together and, um, and to continue to enhance our, uh, our spiritual life. I, obviously, during COVID, we have a lot more time to think about these things than we might have otherwise. And uh, it's certainly been true for me. Um, and uh, so I've heard Doy talk about these aspects of practices before, but I uh, never quite knew the basis of them. So I'm looking forward to hearing more about it. Thank you. And also you're a cradle Episcopalian and have just always done these things. Well, sort of. <laughs> sort of. Okay, well, it doesn't matter. Um, Al does certain um, things up at church and I do things and I thought it might be fun for us to do this particular thing together. So I'm Margie um, and um, let's see, uh, we've gone to Epiphany, I guess, for seven years. I'm not really sure. Um, uh, like Al, um, at this time in our life, we are especially enjoying the opportunity to uh, think more about these things and practice more of these things and share more of these things together. Um, so I think this has been great. And um, I think I told Doit when we were raising our kids and so forth, we never talked about religion. We were just too busy getting on to the next day, getting to church, doing things, but never really taking the kind of time that we take now. So I think that has been for us very special. Um, at church, right now, I'm working on stewardship and helping do it with that. And that's kind of been my big thing. And you'll be hearing more about it next week. Yeah, that's kind of a big thing. I'd say it's sort of a big thing. Margie and I work about the same number of hours a week. Uh, Diane works a little bit more. Uh, thank you, Margie. Um, uh, Doug or Mike or Diane? 
I'll go. My name is Mike Evans. Barbara and I have been here <clears throat> with the exception of about a three year absence for various reasons since 1968 when we got married. Um, <clears throat> I've been in and out of doing these sorts of things for a long time, trying to always be more regular and sometimes succeeding and sometimes falling off. And I got found this intriguing because I had, I was on the verge of writing Doyd an email about a week ago saying we need to do something on the prayer side around the election. And lo and behold, now we see it, that he's already one step ahead of me. So with that, um, I'm interested to see how this goes. And I've actually read the book some time ago, but it's long gone from my cerebrum, so I'm gonna have to read it again. Thanks, Mike, I'm glad you're here. Um, I have to say a lot of the stuff, maybe all the stuff that we've put in order between now and the election was for that very reason, Mike, that uh, to, to ground us in the reality of the true deeper nature of life uh, and not be so wildly distracted and anxiety provoked by the crazy craze that's going on in our culture. So, yeah. Doug? Yeah. Diane? I'll okay. go. Um, Barb and I have been at Epiphany for approaching five years, and it's been a good gift, a great gift, actually. Um, I think the, the thing that attracted me to the course is, is actually the title of the course and the book. Um, Finding My Way Again has kind of been the story of my faith journey, finding my way again and then again. So you know, recognizing, as, as many of you, um, I've, Barb and I have both sort of practiced off and on, some or all of these, but I think the notion of, of finding my way into those more deeply is what attracted me. And I hope to get out of it, I think through under, a deeper understanding of them, the motivation to actually go do them is, is sort of the connection I'm hoping to make. Um, so we'll see if that happens. The thing that's so interesting about the, the disciplines, and last night I taught a course and Nancy was there on, or I talked a little bit, I don't know if I taught a course, but I talked a little bit about the discipline of fasting. It is both easy um, and, and hard, right? You could spend an entire lifetime becoming somebody who really understands something like fasting or prayer or worship um, or tithing. Uh, and, and it's also super easy. You know, fasting is not eating. Super easy, right? You know, um, and worship's going to church, right? So, so the beauty of the exercises is that they're all pretty accessible, right? They're, they're, almost anybody can get into them or wander into them, and then you can spend your whole life exploring them, which is, just makes them so amazing. Um, uh, anyway, uh, thanks for sharing that, Doug. Uh, Diane, you're an anchor man here. <laughs> um I love this book. I, I read it a couple of times and I, I think it's time to um, stop looking at the gym and get back in it. Yeah, you live in the gym. This is uh, well, good. I, um, so uh, let's, let's uh, well, I'll talk more about why I think about this all the time uh, as we get into the slides, but I have another set of questions if I can figure out how is, um, can you see that up on your screen? What, and let's just go around again, right? Let's, because this is sort of, it's a teeny group, right? Small group and uh, let's, let's, let's have an opportunity to think and participate in this. I'll give you a lot of information, uh, but also this is gonna be conversation because conversation engenders uh, integration uh, of the stuff that we're looking at. Um, so I wonder like what practices have you engaged in in your life? Uh, Nancy, you mentioned some. And, uh, and maybe they're not spiritual practices. They can be any kind of practices. Uh, what are the things you've practiced during your life? And what things are you practicing right now? Well, I would say, um, well, I was thinking spiritually. So I would say um, in, in 2010, I think it was, um, we did a year through the Bible at the church that we belong to. And we took that very seriously and Warren was leading a group discussion and he would get up, you know, at 4 a.m. and prepare. And, and just, it was the first time, I think the kids were finally old enough that I wasn't running around like a chicken with my head cut off in the mornings. 
actually the first time I started reading the Bible every day was when my youngest child first got his driver's license and was driving to school. It's like, well, what am I going to do while he's driving to school? I'm going to read the Bible. <laughs> it's scary. Oh. <laughs> but it stuck. And we've done it ever since. And it really has deepened our, our whole faith life. Just that practice was the, was the seed that stuck and grew and had huge impact on um, our spiritual life and our spiritual life together. Good. That is a good practice, reading the Bible. Uh, that's yep. a great one. Hi, Sophie. We're, we're, uh, we've just gone around and introduced ourselves, uh, and folks answered the first two questions, and now we're on the second set of questions that you'll see up on your screen. And I just, um, wanted, to, oh, I just wanted to finish. I said, it's not like we hadn't read the Bible before. It's like, it was just that the practice of doing it every day all the way through and again all the way through and just continually just doing it was what really changed our perspective and our our faith life yeah, for sure it's a great practice other other uh practices that you've had whether they be spiritual or or not uh along the way and things that you may practice now and they may be spiritual and they may not be well i think um Certainly prayer and worship uh, are the key stones to my spiritual life at the moment. Although my prayer life is um, not as well organized as this is proposing. Uh, it's sort of more haphazard and um, when the opportunity allows, uh, basically. Uh, so having a regular uh, time set aside to do prayer, um, I've not done yet but it might be interesting to do that. Um, beyond that, uh, the Sabbath certainly is something that I uh, appreciate, uh, particularly when I was in uh, the practice of medicine. I, my philosophy when I was practicing medicine was uh, I go home when I've got everything taken care of with all of my patients. And um, that might be somewhat into the evening. Uh, but when I did get home, I would leave it all at the office, so to speak, unless I was called back. And um, uh, so that time, like Sunday, to me, when it's time to rest, uh, I try to do exactly that, try to rest from what I'm normally dealing with all day long. Um, so I think that that's a healthy thing and be with my family. But the fourth thing was, was having the meal as being a center of, of your life. And certainly Margie and I have tried to practice that with our family. And um, Margie usually would hold dinner until I got, until I got home, unless they were really starving. But, <laughs> but uh, uh, we always try to have our meal as a family. And I think over the years, that's proven to be very effective in, in raising four children. And uh, I noticed now that they're adults and have their own kids, that they pretty much try to do that also. So I think that's a, a, a good tradition they've uh, they've inherited from us. So that, those are the practices I've been thinking. Well, uh, you mentioned practicing medicine. You, you practiced medicine? Uh, yes, sir. Tell me about that. Oh. What's it mean to practice medicine? I don't get it. Well, taking care of patients is usually the practice of medicine. Although medicine, what I didn't know when I entered the profession of medicine was that there were so many ways you can utilize the education and, and be involved in medicine. Uh, so my the stereotypic idea being, well, you practice medicine, you see patients all day, et cetera, et cetera. Or if you're a surgeon, you operate all day. Um, I was a medical oncologist taking care of cancer patients. and uh, I took care of them from the time they were diagnosed to the ultimate result, which hopefully might be cure um, and follow up, or it might be death. And uh, and so, now, you to, when you yeah. were you better as an oncologist uh, when you started or when you retired? <laughs> Definitely better when I retired because. I had a lot more experience. 
or Plus maybe you gain by experience. Yeah, a lot of practice under your belt. Yeah, a lot of practice. Right. So it's interesting, right? There's there's certain professions. Sophie is in is in one that they call it the practice of, right? Because over time, if you practice, you, you presumably get better. Right. You know. No uh, question. Right. So then, so it's interesting that, and you know, if you keep practicing, you practice means seeing enough patients. You see enough patients. You see enough cancer. You see enough cancer. You you know what you're looking at. You diagnose it more quickly or more accurately. So. And so over time, it's, it's why you don't, want, you don't want your oncologist to be right out of medical school. You want your oncologist to be like an old guy who's a lot of cancer. Well, at one point, you are a young kid. <laughs> I wish you had gray hair back then because patients would be uh, more likely to, uh, to uh, uh, appreciate you. <laughs> yeah, we, practice. we practice a lot of things. Uh, Margie, what have you practiced? Well, I was just thinking about that. Um, I love hymns, and every once in a while, I sit down at the piano after years of practicing that, and Al, and play hymns, not often enough. But Al frequently says to me, I can't believe you can do that, but that's because of years of, of practicing, you know. Right on. So you develop, you develop muscle memory, right? Mm -hmm. For sure. To practice like practicing the piano is an activity that develops muscle memory and you sit back down even after not playing for a long time and you can play because that's become part of the system because that's what practice that's that's what practice does you know you, so that's inter practicing piano that's uh other practices people have participated in over their lifetime one um that's not on the seven list that I- No, no, yeah, can you get off the seven list? Yeah, it's, it's just um, small group. And sometimes that group is as small as two of us, me and somebody else. Mm -hmm. And sometimes it's a little bigger, but that notion of a combination of a place to be cared for, to be accountable to, to pray together, all that stuff that you all know, that's a practice that's, that's been helpful. Um, and Al, to your point, I think, although not exactly sacred meals, meals together over the years, when we were in California, we had um, Sunday suppers. Actually, they were Sunday champagne suppers, but nonetheless, they were a gathering time for the neighborhood every week. And that was a wonderful time just to be together in that cadence of the week was, was rich as well. Um, and then finally, one I haven't practiced that wished I, would have, I wish I would have more is, is Sabbath. You know, whether it's the, the literal day or just that notion of rest is uh, is something I've missed out on. So hoping to learn more about. Did you um did you play any sports growing up? Oh yeah. What was that like? I practiced, but I never got much better. So I just disproved the entire theory. Okay, let's, let's find another athlete. Warren, yeah. somebody come on, Sophie, help me. <laughs> well, I never did golf because I couldn't get better at it, but I did do others. <laughs> yeah. Have you ever gone out like, you know, I played a ton of tennis as a kid and uh, I, you know, if I haven't played for a long time, I'd go out on the court and man, I'd start playing and my body just fall right back into the rhythm. And after about, you know, 10 minutes, I'm all sore and I got a pulled muscle, right? And I can't, you know, like I'm a mess because my body remembered how to serve, but my muscles hadn't, hadn't gone along with it, right? So the yeah. best way to pull a muscle is to go out and do something that you have muscle memory for that you don't have body capacity anymore for. Yeah. 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 It's usually two days later where the soreness sets in for me. <laughs> it sets in. Yeah. Other things you practice, Warren? Anything else you practiced along the way? Not golf. Not golf. No golf. Uh, lots of sports, but you know that's for that. You know, it's been a long time since I've uh, uh, done some of that uh, of any consequence. Skiing now and then. I picked I picked up boarding. Uh, I used to snow ski, and uh, um, I got to the point where if we went, we we didn't go often enough that if I skied, I was just never really as good as I had been, and and it was just kind of disappointing. So I picked up boarding because I couldn't get any worse at it. I, I was terrible. 
Um, and that was fun. So uh, I don't know, again, it took a lot of practice. I was able to keep my head off the snow. That was good. Right on. How about you, Sophie? Maybe introduce yourself and say. Uh, sure. I'm Hi, everyone. I'm sorry I'm late. I was having some technical difficulties with my computer. <laughs> um, so I just took a break from work. I've been a practicing lawyer for, I don't know, 25 years or so. And I was at my last job for 11 years and I'm on a sabbatical. And so I've been practicing a lot of things. <laughs> um, first of all, I've always gone to church. That's always been a big part of my practice in my spiritual life, but I feel like I want more. And so I started doing Deutz Friday morning um, class, you know, the Bible studies with the rector. And then I signed up for EFM education for ministry, which starts today with Diane. Um, and then I got a piano. <laughs> Um, my piano from grow from growing up had died, and so I actually just recently got a piano, and I decided I would start to do that. So I guess I'm sort of a lifelong learner, and um, exercise. So I'm doing a lot of things, and then what I really want to do next is to move into a different job, and probably something in a nonprofit world and give back. And so I'm sort of going through my own sort of personal discernment right now after being in a corporate setting for many many years and working really hard and. I was relating to, um, I, I, Marjorie, I'm not sure what your husband's name is. I don't see it on here. Al. Al. I was appreciating what you were saying, Al, about that idea of, you know, as much as you may love your job, you, you become wedded to it. And that was the case for me. So I think I'm reveling a little bit and having a lot of time to myself um, in a different way. I have one son who lives with me at home who is on the autism spectrum, so he's very quiet. And that's a little hard for me. I'm a social person. I love him, but um, he's not, there's not a lot of resonance, frankly, in my house right now. Um, so that the other thing about these kinds of um, groups for me is also a bit of a social um, component, I think, and community. Maybe that's a better way to put it. I really need community. The other thing I'm actually good at doing, I think, is mentoring. I do a lot of mentoring and I do a lot of outreach. And so some of the folks in the parish that are older, I check in on them and make sure they're doing well. and. So I feel like I'm enjoying um, a lot of practices right now, <laughs> um, maybe a little too many. <laughs> but the other thing about this would be to put, put some, I guess some put some meat on the bone spiritually. So that's what I'm looking to get out of this. Here's the good thing. You can't pull a spiritual muscle. Mm, that's true. Um, <laughs> and, and the other thing is, uh, and this is why the spiritual practices are so powerful. The older you get, the better you are out. Right. I mean, so so there is, you know, there is an ascending thing that, that your body can't wear out. Like, you know, the older I get, the worse I get at tennis. <laughs> no matter what. <laughs> terrible. Right. Um, some point you won't be going, you know, 45 miles an hour on your bike, Doug. Uh, you know, it, it, but but the spiritual practices it, right right through and it is cut through, which is so extraordinary. So this is the right time to be, this is, there's never not a right time to, to start them up and, and they, they just keep going like this. Mike, do you have anything you've practiced along the way before we move on to, uh, you did a little medicine practicing too, I think. Little, little singing practice, Mike. You're on mute. Or I think, maybe you're not. A... There we go. Um... As I said, more or less retired, I still do some stuff with Kaiser Permanente in my dotage. Um, got a small group. Al's part of it. We meet every Wednesday morning. I've been doing that with Ch Mark Hutchison and Chuck Pope and uh, various other people since 1975. Um, praying daily, although not every day, intentionally sort of haphazard and or on the fly when I think of it so I need to get better at that. Being in the choir I don't miss very many Sunday services and haven't since this all happened. I think we're tithing. Um, I haven't really done the math to make sure but uh, what else is on the list? I forget. I don't have it up. Worship, prayer, uh, tithing, Almsgiving? Is that on there? Well, no, like but it, 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 the tithing and almsgiving is a wrap. Same yeah. 
So I also chair, co-chair the social, um, the uh, service and outreach committee. So that keeps me in touch or us in touch with what's going on and around us quite a bit, especially now. That's, a, that's an important thing. Well, I want to quick touch on the syllabus, then I want to get into this little content. Um, this is the way we're going to break it out. Um, uh, the, we're going to look at the chapters two through eight next week, chapters nine through 14 the week after, chapters 15 through 20 the week after that, and then on the 20th, what does this all mean? So that's loose syllabus, if that's okay. Yep. Can I move on? We got to leave that up there for a second. That's uh, there you go. <laughs> you got Doug down there with a the knife sharpening his pencil, and Al just taking a photo <laughs> of the screen. It's, uh, that's life in the kingdom of God. So, so what I want to talk about a little bit is why spiritual practices now, okay? And and I want you to jump in if you have questions or thoughts. Um, but but what what we have is is God God puts things in the world, right? God has created the world and included all these things together. Um, and, and then they sort of come to blossom at a particular time along the way. And what I would say is the spiritual practices or the spiritual exercises or the spiritual disciplines uh, are all the same thing, um, is an activity that's been around for a long time uh, because it is fundamental to what it means to be formed as a human being. But what we see that is happening that's different, I maintain, is that it is gaining a new authority authority. All right? So track with me on that. Because, you know, how long has prayer been around? A pretty long time. And worship, a pretty, you'll learn exactly how long, Sophie, and uh, EFM. But these things have been around for a long time. Uh, so why, what's changed? What's new now? And that's the thing that uh, I'm going to talk about. It's a old thing with a new authority. Have you heard me talk about this? Thank you. Thank you for listening. Uh, so as you know, I believe this is the age of the Holy Spirit. Who's the great saint from Italy who talked about this? Joaquim Fiore. Yes, A plus. There are grades here, incidentally, uh, in this class. It's, uh, Winners and losers in the kingdom of God. No, there's no winners and losers in the kingdom of God. And Joachim of Fjord, he had this idea, 2,000 years of God the Father, 2,000 years of God the Son, 2,000 years of the Holy Spirit, starting right now, actually a little bit back uh, with um, William Seymour, the great one-eyed African-American preacher in Houston, and then on La Brea Street in L.A. So, so you have this age, but there was a genius insight uh, that came out in a book written by Phyllis Tickle about authority in these ages, where the authority of the church or the authority of spiritual leadership is found. And this was brought to us by this guy. Now, maybe you've heard me talk about him, but not as much. His name is Bishop Mark Dyer. And Bishop Mark Dyer was the Anglican Bishop of Bethlehem, Pennsylvania, uh, and he uh, had been a Catholic priest and had been the dean of a seminarian and had been the papal, tell me, have you heard this story? Been the papal theologian to the Pope. So the Pope goes around the world and he picks, in his case, really smart guys to write theology for him. And when he has a theological idea or whatnot, he, he says, okay, I want you to distribute this to these papal theologians. Mark Dyer was a young, brilliant Catholic priest from Boston, and he sounded like he was from Boston. And, uh, and he was given uh, an assignment, for, he'd been given a bunch of assignments, given an assignment by the Pope to write about the seven ecumenical councils of the church, right? And uh, so Bishop Mark Dyer goes out there to write about that 
uh, that nobody cared about, really, but the Pope asked him <laughs> to write about it. And uh, he came back to the Pope. He said, say, look, at you know, he was real academic. Say, look, at the, there's really, honestly, only five ecumenical councils of the church, um, not seven. It was after the Council of Trent, and there was really five. And the Pope writes back and says, there were seven. I want you to write on the seven ecumenical. <laughs> Mark goes back and soldiers. And he goes, you know what? I mean, I'd like to write on the seven, but, but there's really only five. It's just, there's five and there's not seven. And the Pope sends him back a letter, you know, like rolled up, you know, it's like the wax on it, you know, holding it together. And it rolls up and it says, recant or be excommunicated. He's like, oh. What the, what do I do? Like, what do I do? So he's the dean of a seminary, Catholic seminary, and he goes and he puts his head on the floor of the chapel for 40 days and fasts and prays. And he gets up at the end of 40 days and he walks away from the Catholic Church. He becomes like a school teacher, like in a middle school in some place in Pennsylvania, starts going to an Anglican church, and they find out that he's this genius guy and they ordain him. And he becomes the bishop of uh, Pennsylvania. Or, well, Bethlehem. And then he becomes my professor at Virginia Theological Seminary. And my mentor, and I, and I studied, I did one-on-one -on -one tutorials with him uh, one summer. Great guy, since died. Then he got married to a radiologist and he adopted like a bunch of kids and fabulous man, great human being. Anyway, so he's with Phyllis Tickle, who's also a genius, and uh, they're, they're talking and they're talking about Joachim of Fior, of course, who wouldn't it be? Uh, probably Evan Scotts at some bar, knowing Mark Dyer. And, uh, and they start talking about authority in the church. And Mark has this insight that within the framework of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, there are different levels of authority that take place. Start and, 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 and every 500 years, this is his insight, a new sort of way, uh, a new type of authority comes in and takes precedent for a period of time. You with me? So Mark goes all the way back to Moses. And Moses brings forward for the people of Israel the authority of the law. And 500 years later comes King David and the kings as holding the authority for religion, right? And 500 years later comes the Babylonian exile, right? Almost right. And in the Babylonian exile, the authority uh, became the, um, uh, what do you call it? The uh, diaspora. Diaspora. Thank you, Mike. And then what came 500 years after the Babylonian exile? Jesus. Jesus Christ, right? And, and the discipleship model of authority within the church. And none of these authorities incidentally go away, right? But they just, they go, they fade into the background as the new thing comes up, right? The other thing sort of, and then the other thing sort of refreshed along the way, but there's this new authority. 500 years after discipleship model, what came? Oh, this is tricky. This is the toughest one. No. Yeah. The, the church, um, St. Benedict, and the monks, right? And yeah. the nuns, right? Those guys, because Rome falls apart, right? Goes to ruins, and, and the, the, the monks come together, and they become the new authority and the power within the church. This is Dyer's insight, super interesting, because it really almost works, right? You know what comes, now this next one's very tough, too. The next one is the ascension of Rome and the bishops, right? And, and that comes about 500 years, and it's particularly notable in 1048, which is when? Great schism. Exactly. Genius. Good job, Mike. So you have the great schism between Constantinople and Rome, right? That's, that's when those two churches break apart, 1048. The next one, 500 years from 1048. Reformation. Reformation. Ding, 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 ding. Reformation, right? So you got the Bible now becomes that. Like you have the authority of the Bible, exegesis, how you read the Bible, right? The authority of the preacher, that comes into play, right? So, yeah. And then 500 years after the Reformation comes. Now. Now. The age of the Holy Spirit. <laughs> the age of the Holy Spirit. But, but it also, not but and, it comes with a new authority. So where does this new authority now lie? 
See how all this works together? <laughs> the Holy. See how this all works together? I mean, God makes it super simple for us uh, to understand what God is doing in the world. And this new authority is the holy temple of the human. This thing, right? Now, Jesus talked about it, didn't he? When did he talk about it? So we got a little pattern of what this looks like in Holy Scripture, don't we? So anybody have these verses memorized? Anybody have the Bible with them? Let me know John 2. Come on, Nancy. I know you do because you listen to all of the John 129. John <laughs> talks, the only person maybe in the world that did no, that. There were a lot of us. Well, I'm glad. So anyway, you remember what Jesus says? Uh, what's Jesus say? Um, let's see. He says right here, uh, Jesus answered them, talking to the zeal for your house will consume me. The Jews said to him, what sign can you show us for doing this? And Jesus answered them, destroy this temple and in three days I'll raise it up again. What's he talking about? Right? The Spiritual movie. stuff. Right? So then what happens in Acts 2? We get, we get the shift. So Jesus says, my body is going to be the temple. But then in Acts 2, we have what happened. Pentecost, isn't it Pentecost? Yeah, with Pentecost, right? We have the movement of the Holy Spirit, and the Holy Spirit comes blowing into us and changes us, right? And then we see Paul capture that in 1 Corinthians 6, where he says, and what happens, so what happens at Pentecost? Like The prophets back here are talking about uh, in the time of the diaspora and the, the time of uh, Babylon, they're talking about human. the human heart has become what? The human heart's become big old stone. It's become hard, right? And the prophecy is calling out. They're saying, give me a new heart. Like, give me a new heart because this heart is terrible. Ezekiel says it. Jeremiah says it. And so what we see happen at Pentecost in Acts is God comes in and gives humanity a new heart, the, a capacity for a new way of being in the world. And what I believe, you can think this is just crazy, but I believe that there was a shift. God actually did sort of a, a en masse a evolutionary jump up, if you will, and said, we're moving the human heart. Uh, we're making it capable of holding within it the Holy Spirit. By invitation, we talked about that at Bible study. But Paul then reinforces that concept in 1 Corinthians 6, chapter, uh, what is that chapter? Uh, 6, of verse 19, where he says, Or do you not know that your body is a temple mm -hmm. of the Holy Spirit? Right? So, so Jesus identifies it. Jesus changes us. We now are a temple for the Holy Spirit. Now, that was true in the time of the uh, monasticism, the priests in the Bible, right? But, but we, we are now prepared, or we have a new authority. In the Bible, uh, and, that, and that comes not a moment too soon. Because what is happening in our world right now? Chaos. Chaos, right, sister. Right? I mean, and, and who don't we trust? Anybody in authority. Authority's gone, right? And, and so we don't trust our leaders, uh, and we don't trust the information they give us. Uh, and, and sometimes, uh, my dad always maintained, Al, you might appreciate this, Mike, um, he's a rheumatologist, and he says, the more you read about rheumatoid arthritis on the internet, the less you know. <laughs> like the more confusing it is. Like, uh, right? If you were to read everything that you could about rheumatoid arthritis on the internet, you would be, you'd have no idea what to do. Your brain. Right? Blows. And then if you don't trust your doctors on top of that, uh, hopefully you do still. Doctors still have a lot of trust. But, right? So we are in a time when the authority must change. And the authority is changing, right? In what well, way? Uh, because the opportunity is for actions to represent character and actions to incite change. So it doesn't matter anymore what you say. 
It doesn't matter the information you impart. It matters what you do in the formation of the Holy Temple, right? What you do in the formation of this temple. And so that's what the spiritual exercises do. They've been around for a very long time, but their orientation is to right order the temple. And a right ordered temple has authority, religious authority, right? Authority to be the people of God in the world. Not because we're told what to do, but because we are transformed into what we were made to be by the things that we do. And we don't have to tell people about that. They see it through our actions. You with me? Isn't that cool? Well, we've always been taught that Christian character means something. Mm -hmm. And what you do means something. So where does this leave the usual Anglican three-legged stool tradition of scripture, tradition, and reason in the process of sure all I this? I where it leaves the scripture, tradition, <clears throat> and reason. So what I would say, Mike, uh, is that when something new comes in, it doesn't mean something old is thrown out. Right. I mean, we still uh, 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 take aspirin, uh, even though there's antibiotics, antibiotics. Right. I mean, uh, it is a way of thinking about things, but I would say it's not the prime authority. It's OK to think about scripture, tradition and reason. Um, but what the, the church of the future is going to be the church that focuses on character formation the formation of the temple. Um, and, and what I would, let's move on to the next. So there's, so now we're gonna look real quickly at, ca at character formation and community formation. Uh, what happens in this age of the Holy Spirit. And the first thing that happens when we, when we practice and we take seriously uh, the formation of this temple um, is that the practices are about the right order of a person. So knowing information and knowing about tradition, reason, and scripture doesn't ensure that you will be a practicing or an acting out in the world Christian. Have you heard of priests that may know a lot about the Bible and know a lot about the tradition and maybe even be good reasoners and then do something horrible? How can that be? Because they are in a disordered state of being, right? In fact, one of the things that often happens is people put their body at the center of their life or they put their mind at the center of their life and everything becomes around the service of the mind or the service of the body or the service of the neighbor. And when that thing, as Dallas Willard talks about, and Brian McLaren's a Dallas Willard uh, disciple, when our system is out of order, we are disordered. We are out of relationship with God, right? So the spiritual exercises seek to get us in this order where our heart, right? You, you've seen me talk about this, haven't you? The ontological nature of a person, the ordered system of a person. Have most of you heard that talk? A little bit, you know, Warren, you have, right, Sophie? So, so the idea is that the exercises prioritize the spirit, the mind, the, body, the mind, thoughts and feelings, the body, relationship with the community uh, for a right ordered soul. That then is what is sort of the, the authority of the church. The, the, I'm trying to get my screen fixed. The right order, the, a clean temple, if you will. A clean temple, if you will. And what that does then is that, that uh, reveals the person that God made. Right, so, so we are not meant to change ourselves. We are meant to reveal uh, that whom God made, that the person that God made. Um, the other thing is we are known for what we do. So I always say to parents, and you guys know this, uh, kids listen to about three, depending on how old they are, 
10 to 3 to 0 percent of what you say but they always know what you do right they know what you do you are known to your children to the people who are closest to you because of what you do not necessarily because of what you say am i right yep that's an amen isn't it right i mean that's we know that to be true it, the meals you ate margie and al you didn't tell your kids about that they saw you do it and now they do it that's how it works um uh and we're shaped by our actions like we talked about that muscle memory of playing the piano or playing the guitar mike you played the guitar or practicing medicine we have these muscle memory uh, that happens for this temple and then we become the kind of person that accidentally lives the authentic life because that's just the way we formed ourselves you with me yep. that's the that's the idea and what that means then is our community becomes a place where people act like christians so when people come to church they say gosh this is such a great place i wonder why is it because you have such a good program for hospitality? No, it's because we have a bunch of Christians here, right? So that's the idea. That's why, you know, like all of the programs for hospitality, like all this program stuff, um, you just want people that are right ordered, heart, mind, body, neighbor, soul, people who practice and then are habitually Christians in the world. Have you ever met somebody who's an habitual Christian? And you're just like, that's a great person. Mm -hmm. Anybody know Judy Mayot? Yeah. Or Mike Evans? <laughs> right? I mean, we meet these habitual Christians. We're like, I want to be like them. Well, how can I be? And you know what you, you always find with habitual Christians? It's universal, incidentally. There's one characteristic that always abides in the life of a habitual Christian. Joy? Yes. That's exactly right. It's always joy. There's always that, that joy, like they're smiling and giddy. It's like they know some weird secret. Um, and it's just because they know they, they're just right ordered. And when you're right ordered, right, you got, the, you got the flow. That's exactly right. So the, this place is the community creates a spiritual gym where we practice these exercises. And then people, they come, they're like, ah, oh, what's going on? It's a weird place. Everybody's full of joy. <laughs> full of joy, right? And then they're not jerks or anything, right? They they just have this nice way of being. That's the point. So we're a place that we do practice that. Right? We're a place where people are authentic Christians. They act like what Christians ought to act like. And then people are like, well, maybe I, you know, because when they see people who might be experts on reason, tradition, and scripture, but are jerks or or good. <laughs> You are sexually miscon, whatever they are, <laughs> misconducting or whatever, right? Then you're like, how, how can that even be? They're not Christians. We form the temple. Then that's the authority that draws people back to the love of God. So we become a place that models this. And that leads to naturally, not intentionally, naturally to evangelism. See, all this stuff's working together, right? In the age of the Holy Spirit, in the, the temple, and the spiritual exercises. And the new role of the church for evangelism is this. Mm -hmm. If you could just get stewardship on this foil, Margie would be happy. Well, it is on this. It's called, it's tithing, right? So when people tithe, you know, if everybody in our parish tithed, we would probably have $10 million a year coming in here. Right, I mean, we'd have more money we would ever, ever know what to do with. And then we'd just be like throwing it out the door. Honestly, now that's not an exaggeration. We would be just giving it away en masse, right? Um, and there are some churches, the Mormon church does that, for example. The Mormon church, it gives away tons of money because every Mormon is required really by like checking their tax records to tithe. And as a result, the, they're just, they're giving it away. Um, it's called coercion. It's called or something, right? Or maybe it's called community. Or maybe it's called a spiritual gym. I don't know. Um, uh, or maybe, you know, but, but that is, that should be there, Warren. I mean, it's, uh, we're working on it. Questions on this? You guys with me? 
Let's see what let's see what else happened. Hey, hey, Doug. Yes, Doug. I just had a, a maybe a question on that previous slide. Quickly, yeah. the um, the bullet on the revelation of the human potential as hidden in each person. I'm just I'm just thinking around that, thinking that the potential word feels a little performative to use the current vernacular. I, mean, that I agree with the notion. I love this um, page, but the notion of it. Really, all we're revealing is is each of us uniquely created, and, and what that turns out to be is who knows. So when I when I see the word potential, I, I wonder a bit about how that might be a little more um, full of expectation than, than intended. I don't know. Um, so would you? What word might you use there? I'm not sure. I'm, that's why I wanted to think around it before I said something. But um, <laughs> I, I think just giftedness. Well. Or does that matter? I guess whether it's giftedness or it just reveals, it reveals, I think that right order reveals you know, each of us uniquely created. And what happens with that, whether it's potential or giftedness, who knows? But yeah, that's so, all. Yeah. I'm not Earlier disagreeing. We, I'm just thinking around that word a bit. Yeah. yeah. I may disagree ultimately, but yeah. when, <laughs> Dwight brought up uh, Dallas, Dallas Willard's ontological model. And if I recall correctly, and maybe I do, maybe I don't. Um, he talks about how, you know, we are who we are and we're, we're growing up in life. And over time we develop these grooves. We, we get, we get grooved. Um, we get roughed up. We get these, these behaviors, these characteristics get, that get worn into us yeah. by our own behavior, by our parents, by our brothers and our friends. And those grooves, uh, they change, we have our shape, but we're just all grouped up. And we, yeah. we, we don't behave, we behave in response to the, the grooves and not who we are. Mm -hmm. And the, the spiritual practices are about smoothing out those grooves. Yeah. And so that potential, mm -hmm. that capability, that beauty was always there. It's just that with our own, with time and the world and ourselves, it's just been marred. Mm -hmm. uh, that's how I saw it, Doyle, and, right. and I kind of yeah. think that fits right there with that. Yeah, that's a helpful one. Yeah, and maybe giftedness is the better word, for, at least for me. Yeah, I'm just, yeah. Yeah. Have you ever seen a kid do something that they just love, and they might not even be that great at it, but they think they're great at it? Yeah. <laughs> and, uh, and it's just like, I, I always get all welled up when I see that. It always makes me want to like cry i don't know why because it's just so beautiful yes. like, beautiful um yeah. when they're, they're, they're just like, oh, i'm so great at you know whatever it is even if they're not great it doesn't matter they're like just like in it that's the thing right and then there's joy right the joy is just blowing right. out all over the place when they're doing it that's what god wants for each one of us yeah. um Thanks. and so i know sophie and diane have to leave in a minute uh because diane has her next uh class next Zoom. <laughs> but so one of the things that so I want to get into the book just a, a bit the first chapter, you know, uh, McLaren talks about beliefs versus practices. And in his mind, uh, and if you look at the old authority of scripture, it became a, there became this sort of litmus test of what you believe. And if you believe it, if there's an intellectual assent, then everything's good. And, uh, and what they found is People can say, I believe that uh, Jesus Christ is Lord and Savior, and they're still crappy people. They're terrible to their spouse. They're bad at work. They lie, you know, whatever. And, and so you're like, ah, uh, you know, or they support somebody crazy, you know, uh, because they know they're going to, they're going to heaven. And, uh, and that, uh, the idea of the beliefs, like th those are good, but, but that they are, create good people is the, is the question at hand here. Um, and uh, McLaren and myself and Willard and many others believe it's the practices that form good people. And I'm going to just touch on these. The spiritual practices, um, it's hard to reject someone's spiritual practice. It's easy to reject their belief. Right? You can get an argument about somebody's spiritual practice you, you, or, or, or belief. You can't get an argument with their fasting or going to church or the thing that they do, right? One of the beautiful things about the spiritual practices now is they, they're coming at the really right time 
uh, because they're non-materialistic and we need more non-materialism in our world given what's happening in our world, right? So you see the, the confluence is coming down uh, all together. God's doing this new thing. We need the authority to be fasting and not buying, right? Um, so, uh, and, and the idea of the disciplines is you begin to capture patterns of the sacred. Um, but they're like anything, right? It's what makes you know, a, a, a successful banker or a successful uh, coach, right? Y you have to keep doing it, right? I always tell Desmond it's not important what he learns when he studies, it's important that he gets good at studying, right? It's a discipline of the study. Um, and that's why, you know, my wife and I, she's way smarter than I am and school was way easier than for her than me. And because it was so hard for me, I became disciplined because that's the only way you can survive, you know, if you don't have the natural aptitude. So um, it's, it's holding to the disciplines. Uh, that's, that's the tricky part of the spiritual disciplines, right? You can't reject somebody for doing yoga. Right, you, you can't, um, that's just an example. So I wanna go on. Um, and this is the last thing I'll talk about. In our culture, now this, this might be totally not worth our time, but, but I'll bring it up anyway, because uh, um, McLaren talks about it. There are four pursuits of the good life or fulfillment that we find in our culture uh, today. Um, talks about sort of the getting the answer and the getting the answer doesn't necessarily make you a good person. Or the knowing the truth, right? Um, and we see that with fundamentalism. And that, of course, doesn't necessarily lead to the good life. There's this sort of vapid consumerism, like that seeking the distraction, you know, the next thing that you're hoping is going to come in the mail from Amazon, right? And then what happens after that thing comes? Ready for something else. And you order something else, and then that, and then then you order something else, um, and and what he talks about in this book is living particular patterns, is the authority that unlocks uh, the Christian, the religious, the the godly dynamism in the world today. So that's the stuff. It's the stuff I have for this evening. Any. Uh, Surprises? Uh, any anything? Reflections? Directions? For me? Things we need to do, hear more about, or anybody? Anybody? <laughs> All right. Well, thank you guys for stepping into this. It's always a, it's such a pleasure for me and a privilege to go through and like think about this stuff, right? And to, to put this stuff together, um, I find it uh, uh, really uh, personally formative. So I'm grateful to you uh, for being here tonight. Thank um, you. Thank you for your yeah. time. Oh, you're kidding. I love this stuff. Um, uh, does anybody feel so moved to pray? Pray us out. Got a prayer leader here. <laughs> Come on, you can't screw up prayer. That's the great thing about it. Doug, do you mind giving us a prayer? I'll be happy to. I'll tell you that on that. <clears throat> Father, thank you for, um, for privilege, for the privilege of gathering to, to start to press into this, uh, to do it together as a small part of a bigger community. Thank you that your love is, is many, many thousand years old, mm -hmm. and yet it's new. And thank you for the revelation of that, even tonight as we gather together. So we go from here um, encouraged, uh, if not joyful, at least encouraged, and we're grateful that we can be together, and uh, thank you for this time. We pray in your son's name. Amen. Hey, peace, guys. Thanks. Thank you so much. Be well. See you. Okay. Thanks.